professor of electrical engineering at MIT. He is very well known for his textbook, which he co-authored, called The Structure and Interpretation of Computer Programs, CP, which was used for several decades at MIT and has been translated into many languages. Um, as it turns out, he has a student that some of you who recognize the name Guy Steele. And together with a student, they invented this uh, really awesome language called Steam, um, which some of you may have heard of. So without further ado, can we please have a very warm welcome for Joel J. Sussman. Thank you. Well, this sounds like fun. Uh, one thing that's interesting is I've been programming computers for a ridiculously long time. I've been programming computers since, I suppose, 1962, when the then undergraduate, eventually my provost, Joel Moses, was an undergraduate at Columbia, and he taught a class in computer programming for high school students. Hmm? I don't know. That mic is not necessary. I'm, if you can't hear me, that's a problem. <laughs> okay? It's your ears. Okay. Fine. Okay, because, no, this mic is to make the, uh, uh, the videographer happy, not for, I, I, I don't, do not like to get amplified, okay, in a room. So anyway, uh, Joel Moses taught this class, and uh, I was, learned how to program on a, a 650 data processing system, IBM 650, which had 2,000 decimal words of, uh, I suppose, 10, decimal digits represented in biquinary uh, on a drum, on a 2,000 word drum, uh, and the drum took 12.5 milliseconds to turn around, okay, and that was the, uh, so there was a, a, an assembly language which involved two addresses, one of which was the next instruction location, so you could optimize your program so the next instruction would be just after you've done this one. Okay, so that was, that was the, the, my original experience with programming. But I've programmed in almost everything since then. And uh, with that, what, as a consequence, I've learned more ways to screw yourself with a computer than almost anybody I know. Okay? And that's really what I want to talk about today. Uh, because it seems to me that one of the biggest problems people have with programs is writing programs that are dead ends. A dead end, it, what I mean by a dead end is you've written this big complicated piece of software, okay, and then the world changes and something else is needed for it to be done, and then you have to rewrite a ch big chunk of it. Okay, and there's something really wrong with that. Uh, it just shouldn't be that way. I mean, by contrast, consider, consider the human genome. Okay, here we've, got a, here we've got a gigabyte of code, so that's not much bigger than, maybe it's about the same size as GNU Linux. Okay, so let's say you got about a gigabyte of code, okay, and it's the instructions for building you as a very, very complex machine out of a single cell, okay, operating that machine for approximately 70 years reasonably, uh, reasonably well, uh, fending off attackers that are trying desperately to eat you, okay, <laughs> and things like that. And, you know, eventually it fails, that's true, but the bottom line is, and oh, better than that, it doesn't have version skew, okay? <laughs> that is, supposing I took half of Ubuntu 14.04 and the complementary half of Red Hat 23 and put them together, okay, you think it would work? That's how you make more people. Okay, <laughs> okay so there's you know, something very wrong with the way we program and I'm sort of worried about that a lot. Okay, that's, that's, that's one of the things I, I'm thinking about today. But the other thing is, I sort of do want to contrast this with, with biological systems more interestingly, but the fundamental thing I'm worried about is flexibility. Flexibility is the key, key thing that's very different that, that I want to concentrate on that is not, I'm not, I don't care about provability of correctness. It doesn't mean that that's not a good idea. If I have a garbage collector, it better be correct. No, that's, that's right. And there are things that, you know, sure, you want red blood cells to work too. Okay, that's a, there's a few things that have to work, but on the other hand, the, the, uh, most of the time, correctness is not the issue. Security may be a, somewhat of an issue, but maybe the way you do that has nothing to do with proving little theorems about, about cryptography. I mean, after all, any good locksmith will tell you that, you know, the, if your door has got a very good lock on it, the easiest way to get into your house is to break the window. <laughs> okay, so that doesn't work either. So here's what I'm really worried about. I'm worried about acceptable behavior over a much larger class of situations than when it's anticipated by a designer. Okay, that's, that's really what I care about here. 
Okay? And so I want things that have the property that it, if you got something and it works, it does the job you want, and all of a sudden the problem changes, I want it to it'd be not too hard to make it work for the next thing. Okay? Now, consider this character. Okay? This is a, a relative of mine and yours. Okay? Uh, he's a vertebrate, so he's got the same body plan as we have. Meaning that, you know, there's a, there's a nose and a tail, and he's got, a, he's got a, a spine going down it, and all the same organs that we have, and everything like that. We're really pretty much the same creature. It's not, you know, in fact, it's not very much different from us. Look, even for a, uh, in a simpler case, you take, a, you take a human genome, change a little bit of it, and all of a sudden you've got a rabbit. Okay? So that's very flexible. And this is, this is a little bit more than the rabbit change, but not much. Okay, to make one of these. Okay, so this is pretty interesting. Here we have body plans in, in, in engineering. Here's a very famous body plan every electrical engineer knows. This was invented by Major Edwin Armstrong in 1918. It's the standard, standard radio receiver uh, body plan. Okay, it's used for audio receivers is the way it's written here, because that's an audio frequency amplifier you see there, and that's a loudspeaker. But that could have been a video amplifier in a display. That could have been a FM detector rather than AM detector. It could have been something that did something, did something uh, with a digital. Okay, I'm not really worried about the, the, the details. The important thing is that there's a plan. Okay? And of course, uh, my friend over here uh, has the property that he has the same body plan we have in a very deep way, too. He has exactly the same Hox gene sequence that we have. Does everybody know what a Hox gene sequence is? Okay, here's a, here's a sequence of genes that almost every animal past a sponge has. Okay, and they're, all, they're, they're actually in sequence on, a, on a, a chromosome in the same sequence as they are. They represent the, the, the regions from the nose to the tail. They divide up the creature into regions. They don't say anything about what goes on in those regions. Okay? It's just that they're the, 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 the coordinate system. And this guy, of course, we'd expect, we'd expect the same uh, plan we have. Uh, it's, not so, it's not so clear later. We have ideas about this we do all the time. Okay, by the way, if you don't like programs appearing, you should walk out now because there's going to be a lot of code. Okay? <laughs> um, and a lot, of, a lot of it's going about parentheses. But in any, in any case, here's a composition uh, operator, which you all know what a composition operator is. Okay? F of G of X is F, uh, the composition of F of G applied to X. Okay? And indeed, that's sort of a little piece of a body plan. You can have more complicated ones like, like tensors and things like that. I don't really want to go into that, but we, so we, we understand a little bit as engineers what a body plan is. It means that we're specifying the outline of something without specifying the inside. Okay? And that's, that's very important. Uh, here's a guy who's actually a little bit, a li a little bit more different from us, quite different actually. This is a hemichordate called an acorn worm. Um, they're well, what can I tell you about this? It turns out he has exactly the same Hecox sequence we have. Okay? However, he's got his kidneys in his nose. Okay? So again, you're just trying to explain the idea there that there's, now that means that there's a kind of thing I want to be able to talk about today, which has to do with being able to diddle the underside of something that's already laid out. Okay? This is a very dangerous kind of, of manipulation. But it's a kind of thing that gives you a tremendous amount of flexibility. And I said, I said I'm going to be willing to trade off almost everything for flexibility. So I want to, I want to be a really nasty programmer today. Okay, so I'm going to talk about this. Okay, we're going to, this is a, an idea that Chris Hansen and I have been talking about for a very long time. Chris is the, uh, is the principal author of MIT Scheme, MIT GNU Scheme. Okay, so just for those of you who don't know. Okay, and uh, he now works at, at uh, Google, although he worked for me for 26 years. And we're, we're uh, writing a book together on, on stuff like this, on, on flexibility. But in any case, the, I want you to remember this idea. A diamond is very pretty, but it is very hard to add to a diamond. A ball of mud is not so pretty, but you can always add mud, more mud to a ball of mud. <laughs> which I learned from, in fact, Joel Moses or Paul Penfield, I don't know which, at an APL 79 conference. They said that, uh, that one of them said that, and I can't remember which one. Okay? So, that's what I want to talk about. Now, I'm going to do, start with an illustration of a particular numerical process. Uh, again, I, I'm not, I don't know how many of you actually know a lot about numerical things, but I do a lot of that. 
but in, because I like to push planets around in orbits and things, and celestial mechanics. But I'm going to show you a simple, a simple one here, uh, one that you, it's small, small enough you can fit on, on, on a slide. This is a uh, ordinary differential equation. The second derivative of the x function applied to t is some function of time and x of t. Okay? So basically, all I need to know is time and, and, and the position at this time to give me how it's accelerating, whatever this object is. It's Newton's laws. Okay? All Newton's laws look like that, and the x can have a gazillion dimensions for all I care. Okay? It usually does, because it's you know, three dimensions for every particle or whatever you like. Mm -hmm. Now, I might want to discretize this so I can integrate it numerically. Okay? And the one way to do that, of course, is to make a, is to make a discrete approximation to a second derivative, which is what you see there. Right? Uh, that's that, that I can have, a, with h is the step size that you see, okay? So then I can say, take a little bit of x ahead of t uh, now, and the current one, and a little behind, make a linear combination of those, divided by h squared. That turns out to be a good approximation to a second derivative. Uh, and, then, and then I can say that's really a linear combination of various past v values of the acceleration. Okay? That's, that's a, a, a particular one. Stormer's method, for example, uh, Stormer's second two-step method, there's ones up to 20 steps, okay? But Stormer's two-step method is a simple version of this. It's that uh, the, ne the, the next uh, position uh, can be computed from the previous position and the, the current position and the previous position when multiplying by some magic numbers and a linear combination like that, okay? But those magic numbers are selected by numerical analysts to, get the appropriate behavior of being of a bit of converging to the right answer, for example. Okay? That's easy to write such a thing. Okay, so you can write, this is a, a, a Stormer integrator. It takes a history of s states of the system, okay, and uh, you take two times the current value of the position minus uh, one times the previous position, position uh, multiply h squared over 12 by the linear combination of the, of the accelerations uh, for time, pre the current time, the previous time, yes, and the, pre the previous minus one time, okay, the penultimate one there, and that's how, that, that's, that's how you write such a thing. It's pretty, it's pretty easy and it works pretty well, okay? In fact, now, uh, the reason I'm bringing this up is because I'm going to show you some interesting things with this. So here we go. I can make a thing that evolves, evolves this thing. Uh, you know, if I take, I take the integrator, okay, and I'm gonna, I have a function that actually makes the integrator here, and I'm gonna uh, figure, pick out that integrator, make a stepper out of it, and then I have a little loop. This is a loop in a, a well, this is the evolver. It's gonna call the evolver, actually. The loop's down here somewhere, okay? No, that's right, that's right. The evolver is here. So this is the evolver. It takes a history and number of steps I want to go uh, advance it to. I say, gee, have I gotten there yet? If so, uh, I'm done. This, this, I'll just return the current history. Otherwise, I step the history along and uh, n, minus step, n minus one steps. Okay? And I'm returning that procedure, the procedure which is the evolver. Okay? And indeed, and again, you don't have to gobble this up completely right now, although it's easy. Okay, this is not complicated programming yet. There'll be some complicated programming shortly. Okay? And then what happens, I have a stepper here, which extends the history, given a particular history, it extends it by, by, uh, by an appropriate step, by one step. Okay? And that's what's being called here. Okay? So, so look at that. Now here, doing it, just doing it, I'll take a very simple case. The simplest case here is, well, what do I have? I have here uh, a harmonic oscillator. Right, the second derivative of x is x, is minus x, actually. Okay? So that means the answer is sine. Sine is, a, is one possible answer. Of course, there are many possible answers, but sine of t is, a, is an answer. Okay? And so I pick one that's uh, simple enough to understand. Okay? And you know, I'll define that f to be that. I'll make an initial history for myself of, for, for starting at time 0 by 0.01, I have sine of, of, of 0, sine of minus 0.01 to minus 0.02, so that's an initial history. Okay? I'm going to evolve that, uh, that thing and look at the x value of it, and that gives me sine of 100, or sine of, sorry, 100 times 0.01, which is 1. Okay? Sine of 1 is that, 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 not very far apart. It's good to 10 to the minus 7th. Okay? So there's an example of a, of a very simple process. Now, why am I showing you that? Because I'm saying, supposing you built this thing. Now, let's ignore the fact that I've given you a completely trivial thing to integrate. 
and it really, if I were doing something like the solar system, I might want a 12-step integrator or something like that, okay, and I want step sizes of, you know, like one day or something, and, you know, I might worry about that sort of thing. But, um, but by golly, what I'm going to show you is that it doesn't take very much to turn this into a symbolic machine. Okay? And in fact, it's trivial. Now, unfortunately, I'm running off the bottom of the slide. That's interesting. Because I, on, my, on my display, it's not doing that. And I've never used HDMI before. And I see what's happening is, does anybody know what the right thing to do here is? Maybe not, but I've got an idea. No, I've got a better idea. The better idea is to help with the, the, this thing. I am going to, uh, yeah, that's better. That's better, okay? It's a little smaller, but you're seeing the whole thing. Okay? Hmm? Zoom in. Zoom in what sense? Oh. Um, you're not filling up your whole screen. I don't care. Uh, the problem I was worried about is like, well, I was worried about is because these are big enough. Okay, I believe these are big enough. Everybody see this? Yes. Good, okay, fine. Okay, so here, what I'm really going to say is the following. Assume for the moment that I've arranged my system. I've arranged my system so that all the numerical operations in my libra numerical library are in a package. Okay? Where a package is nothing more than a mapping of names to the, to the procedural values of them. Okay? It's some kind of mapping that tells me what each name means. So plus means the thing that adds. Okay? But that's up to me to decide. Okay? Now, if, uh, that, if that's the case, supposing I, I, what I can do, for example, is I can make another arithmetic package, okay, which happens to be a symbolic package. Just give it a name, symbolic. That's all it says there. It starts, it's being built on top of numerical arithmetic, okay, whatever that means. We'll talk about that in a second. Such that the, for every procedure in the, in the numeric package, okay, there is a, it has a name. I'm not even going to worry about the fact that it's a numeric package right now for this case. Okay? The thing for that name will be a new procedure of any number of arguments which constitutes the name onto the arguments. Okay? It's not obvious what that does, right? It's basically building the, the, the parse tree of some, of some algebraic expression. Okay? So now if I've done that, now here's something nasty. Okay? A lot of people are going to get mad at me because I'm going to modify all of the bindings one shot, bang, all my numerical uh, procedures are now symbolic ones. Okay? That's dangerous. Okay? You have to understand, I'm, I'm, I understand this is dangerous. Okay? <laughs> and we can, we can worry about that in a minute. I assure you that I believe that sometimes the danger is worth it. Okay? <laughs> and because, well, you know, th we do this all the time anyway. We have generic operations in, in most of our languages where we have mixed floating and, and, fi and integer arithmetic fixed point perhaps. Okay. That's terrible. You know, by golly, if I if I, I can have a thing that works just great for the integer arithmetic, and if I try to use floating point, it's going to do the wrong thing sometimes. Okay? We know that. How many of you know that the average of two numbers in floating point may not be necessarily between them? <laughs> Does anybody know that? No. Okay. <laughs> for those of you who know, here's a good thing. 996 times 10 to the zero Three di about to three digit precision, plus 998 times 10 to the 0 is 1994 times 10 to the 0. Correctly rounded, that's 994, ni 19194 times 10 to the, the 1. Divided by 2, that's 995 times 10 to the 0. Okay? Now, just, I just want you to understand that, okay, <laughs> so the only reason that you, watch out. People, I wouldn't get into an airplane unless they, it was a test pilot and you tried it out. Okay, <laughs> floating point doesn't, doesn't impress me. But in any case, so this, 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 we do this all the time, but we don't realize that we're being dangerous. And of course, if I write a numerical process that depends upon the commutation of, of multiplication, then of course, if I put in matrices, it may not, be, it may not work. In fact, it won't work. So I've got to be careful when I do these things. Dangerous, sometimes we have to live dangerously. Okay, but in any case, I'm installing that, and now I say, oh yes, what is x0 of the, uh, of the, the result of evolving the Stormer thing one step from an initial history which is entirely symbolic? Bing, I get a symbolic result. Okay? Now, it's not simplified. I could run it through a simplifier. That's a different problem. But I've got something, oh yeah, negate just happens to be the uh, uh, minus zero. It's a unary, unary, unary minus. Okay, but that's 
uh, that's, that's a separate thing. The fact is that I've, uh, this is a very simple process. Of course, I've given something up. We'll fix that in a second. Okay? In particular, the symbolic operators can't do numbers. Right? But I'm going to start, so I'm going to start eva elaborating this process for you. Okay? So what do we have here? We have numerical arithmetic appropriate and symbolic arithmetic when appropriate. So what we really want to do is assign, attach to every operation an applicability predicate that says whether or not it does the job. And I can make sticky notes pretty easily. Um, you know, what most people think that the right thing to do is make make careful record structures that have all the right slots in them and things like that. You know, that's nice when you know what you're doing. 99% of the time you don't know what you're doing. So the right thing, my, my view of the world, again, I'm being very, very extreme today. What I do for, to make sure that everything is really flexible is I do this with, with property lists. That is, I have, a, I have some hash table Okay, and I'm hashing. Uh, I'm making a double entry hash table, and so I'm attaching to every every object the thing that's EQ, okay, to, uh, with a property. And by golly, now I've made a sticky note that I stick on the thing. Okay, so I can find out what things are and what things are not, and whether or not they have this particular applicability property, and so on. Okay, so I'm going to make such a thing like that, and now I'm going to make up a new kind of arithmetic maker that actually has an in-domain predicate. I'm going to pass in. Okay, so for example, I'm making numerical arithmetic. I obviously want to say test for a number. Okay, if it's symbolic arithmetic, well, that's not the same thing. I'll test for being symbolic. Okay, but we ever, whatever that may mean, and we'll worry about that in a second. Okay, so I, I would have those things in there, and then I can make write, write down my numerical arithmetic. Here's my numerical arithmetic package. It's an arithmetic starting with, with the name numeric. That's just a debugging name, so when I'm chasing around inside the machine, I can find out what it is, what, what I've got. Okay, but I start built, built out of the raw scheme arithmetic structure. It has the applicability uh, predicate number. And now, every, it's replacing every operation, okay, with a, um, with, 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 with every operation with name, name, with a, the thing that has the appropriate base operation for that, of that name. Okay, because I'm, I'm not saying how I'm gonna build this. It might be I'm building numeric arithmetic over something else. Who knows, okay? But in any case, Okay, I'll pick out that base operation, and I'm going to make, return the new, the new object, which is an annotated version of the procedure that applies the base operation to the arguments with an applicability that says every one of the arguments for the, this uh, base operation, whatever its arity is, how many arguments it takes, is going to be one of the things that, uh, that's in the domain, according to the in domain predicate. Now, I'm leaving a lot of space for lots of things I'm going to add. Okay, so you don't, don't worry about this yet. And of course, so then it looks like, you know, why did I have to do that? Well, we, we'll see. You'll see later. Okay. So then symbolic arithmetic, I can make pa parametric over the base arithmetic, like this. Okay. And what you see here is that the symbolic arithmetic, well, I'm making a thing called symbolic over the base arithmetic, which in, may, right now in my head is numeric arithmetic, but it might be something else. It might be matrix arithmetic for all I know. Right? But then a test for the word symbolic and it's going to say, well, over that, they take all for every name in there, pick out the base operation, uh, annotate Kant's name argument, that, that procedure, which is the one that makes up, my, makes up my symbolic representation, with an applicability that says any one of the arguments, if any one of the arguments is symbolic and all the others are base. Okay? okay. By the way, if anybody wants to ask questions at any point, I'm perfectly happy to try to answer anything you ask. Huh? Why, you can't hear me? Really? That's amazing. Yes, I'd much rather shout than have a microphone. I, I'm surprised. I talk in rooms with, where we're much bigger than this all the time. Okay, maybe, the, maybe this room has bad acoustics. Look up, you can see why. I don't know, that doesn't say much. It disappears into all that Oh well. Okay. I will talk louder. So anyway, I can also now I make some combinators. Like like we had combinators like compose originally. Compose was a very simple one, but here's a nice one that adds two arithmetics together. I started with two arithmetics, A1 and A2. The name of the result here is add. It's got two pre previous arithmetics, a list of those. And the new in domain predicate is the disjoint 
there's this join, there's the new predicate whose value is the or of the values of the O2 of given predicates that I gave it on the, on the argument. Okay? Uh, and this builds this new thing which says pick up a base operation, each of those, and I'm going to dispatch on the types of these somehow, okay, by their applicabilities actually, and then the, the operation dispatch is going to be something that's very simple. Okay? It's going to say, um, it's going to do, unfortunately it's going to have an order, that's bad, I apologize, okay, it does cause trouble, okay, so there is some ordering I'm uh, putting in here, but it says basically if, a, an op, if the op, one operation is applicable, we'll use it, if the op two operation, uh, operation is applicable, we'll use that, otherwise I've got a bug, okay. So this is a, this is just so far I'm building, a, a building up structure here, and now I can add a little bit more setup, I can say I can extend arithmetic, which basically I'm extending a base by an extension, where an extension is a procedure that takes a base and produces a new, produces a new arithmetic. For example, symbolic is such an extension. Okay? And now, so I can start with something like numeric, extend it by symbolic, okay, and it adds those together, and I can I combine, I can, to combine those, I do that. Okay, I make a new combined arithmetic, and I'm going to install that one. Now you see what really is going to happen. Okay? Now this is, by the way, something I teach classes in. Every spring term, I teach a class on, on things, but, but games like this. And the reason I do that is because I'm in opposition to the standard belief structure of computer scientists, okay? <laughs> Who th think you shouldn't do things like this. Okay? And the reason why I worry about that is because I think they're worrying about the wrong things most of the time. Okay? Uh, what I want to make sure is that it isn't the case that I'm going to spend the rest of my life and everybody who's a programmer spends most of his life fixing code that he's already built or that somebody else has built. Okay? Which is, in fact, it shouldn't be a problem. It should be easy to do that. The hard part should be coming up with ideas and organizations that don't have this problem. And the inspiration, by the way, is Emacs. <laughs> Emacs is a gorgeous program because, explicitly because of the fact that 10,000 people have written parts of it as far at this point. And guess what? It still works as reliable. <laughs> guess. <laughs> yes. This sounds marvelous. I'm not done. <laughs> It'll get more marvelous. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> You're going to buy. You're going to write a big flight control system. Ah. You might write a big avionics package. Let's get avionics. That's better because that's, that's that's got less safety critical. Yeah. That's even more interesting. Right. Or okay. Some medical software. You're going to write, you know, defib software. Well, that was that was less interesting, but the, the avionics one's more interesting. Okay. So you know, in the real world, uh huh. Um, the Raytheons and the Lockheeds and the Martin Mariettas will sort of look at you and go, there's no freaking way I'm going to put this That's aircraft. exactly right. But they will inherit methodologies that give them ability and robustness, but field programmers are going to stick to their C and their assembly. Of course. Or whatever, and they're going to take their, their sort of, you know, decades old methodology to develop these things and dispatch them because well, we really don't want to kill all those people on the plane. Yeah, I agree. And I, I want to point out something very different, though. I think that the people who think that the, the avionics software, for example, the, the, uh, the autopilot, should be perfect, are wrong. Okay? And I'll explain what I mean by that. Okay? Now, it doesn't mean I can convince them. That's a different thing. Because remember, they also have liability problems. Okay? A lot of what goes on in the world is de determined by lawyers. Right. Okay, and that's a real that's a real problem. And as if Shakespeare had an idea about that, right? And was it Henry Henry the Fourth, Part Two, right? Act. So I don't remember. It says first we kill the lawyers. Okay, but <laughs> the the problem is that uh, in avionics software, so let's get, let's consider a, a an autopilot for example. Okay, it's designed to work perfectly when everything is going well. Okay. Now, recently, meaning a few years ago, a, uh, an Air France plane had a pitot uh, tube die. So it got inconsistent information about the airspeed. This caused a, 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 uh, uh, an autopilot to basically turn itself off, okay? Because the autopilot said, gee, I don't know what's going on here. Now, of course, there's plenty of information, 
and plenty of information from lots of things that could have known what was going on. But its job was to not do it, was to do nothing unless, unless it knew exactly what to do. Unfortunately, the pilots were not, did, not, did not understand what happened, and they crashed the plane in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. That's what happened. Okay? The, the right answer, as far as I'm concerned, is that the autopilot should not have turned itself off. It should have done something reasonable. Okay? It should have tried to fly the plane at constant, at constant uh, altitude okay, and, and heading, which it was perfectly capable of doing, because it had enough information to do that, and informed the pilot that something was wrong, that it was getting inconsistent data. Okay? That seems to me to be the right thing. And the, so the fact that it should try, rather than erroring out and crashing, is actually, it seems to me, the, the, the wrong response. And a lot of the stuff we build is built basically to turn itself off so it is not responsible for causing the problem. So that somebody, some somebody's lawyer hasn't, it doesn't, doesn't be get to sue that guy. Let me ask yeah. you a question. Is this yeah. methodology, for example, have you contrasted it with things like developing shuttle flight control software? They're famous, famous for methodology in FCS. Gee, I haven't looked at that, but I'll tell you, I've, I've recently been looking at stuff having to do with automobiles. I'm not going to tell you the details. i tell you, the, the, the insides of automobile software is disastrous. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Anyway, uh, but that's a separate issue. But I think that a lot of the problems in the world are due to, to, due to the way the legal system is structured. You know, you have this idea of you have to blame someone. Okay? And in fact, engineers would do more, far more reasonable things if they weren't in, under those constraints. But that's a that's a, a flame from a different of a different order. Uh, anyway, uh, yes, because I, but I, I tell you, I'm deliberately taking risks here, extreme ones. In other words, the code, the code I'm writing here is terribly risky, on purpose, because I'm be, I'm showing you the extreme end of it. Okay, of course I would want to put in lots of tests and checks and things that things are sensible. That's a different that's a different problem. Okay, so anyway, I want to show you what I can do so far. This is this is only the beginning, of course. Uh, gee, I'm only about halfway through. Okay, so I've got a lot, of, a lot to talk about here. So now, of course, I can still do what I did before. This is the original uh, numerical uh, history that I started with. That was the first few uh, values of, of sine. And I get the same values I got before. It also still works symbolically, but it also works in combination. Okay, meaning I could have part of the thing being numerical and part being symbolic and I can, get the, I can get the result with the uh, symbolic part being, being, being left unevaluated. Okay? So everything seems to be in a nicer state. Okay? I, I like this. And this is the, in a, many ways, this is the way I like to build software myself. I like to build it so I, can, so I can layer it on like this, and if I got a new problem, I'm just going to add more stuff. I want it to be additive. I don't want it to be, I don't want it to be uh, uh, screwing around with what I already got. Indeed, in the case of this numerical stuff, which is pretty easy with, with you know, algebraic or numerical stuff, it is true that this is very structured. And that makes it a lot easier than doing something more complicated. And I, I want to, be, of course, agree with that and be careful to make sure you're all right, you understand that I understand that that's true. This is a very simplified situation. Hardly anything is as, as, as uh, well understood as algebra. <clears throat> okay, but now, you know, look, Mathematicians like to invent funny notations. So, you know, f, of a, f plus g of x is f of x plus g of x. Okay, that just happens to be uh, a convention. We get into all sorts of trouble with mathematical notation, of course. You know that cosine square x is cosine x times cosine x, but cosine of the minus 1x is not 1 over cosine x. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, so that these people are not even consistent, but that's okay. Okay, we, we have to put up with the fact that traditional mathematics is a natural language. And so, that's okay. But in any case, I was supposing I want to put in functions. Okay, well that's easy enough. I make a function arithmetic here uh, over some arbitrary range arithmetic because I'm dealing with the, 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 the values of the functions that are going to be added together or multiplied or whatever. Okay, and I build for another, uh, over, over that, whatever that range arithmetic is, um, I have an a in-domain predicate, which is function test. Function can be whatever I want it to be. I suppose I'm personally writing it as, as procedures, but that's, that's my option. Um, and the, the description, f oops, the description for each uh, of, of these proced uh, named procedures is pick out the range operation, and I say, well, if it's a, uh, 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 I, 
for every for a bunch of functions, if they're all the opera operands of functions, then for a bunch of functions, I'm applying the range operation to the result of applying the functions to the arguments. Okay? That's all that is. And once I do that as an extension over the combined arithmetic, I can now write things like the sum of, of the product of B and the cosine and sine applied to 3A is you know, the appropriate algebraic expression. Okay, so that works too. Okay, so it's, things just get, it's, things get additive in this way. Okay, I might even want, well, you know, here's the thing that mathematicians do, they have coercions. Okay, you know, in this context, one is, a, is, a, is interpreted as a, as a constant function which always produces one no matter what its arguments are. Okay, well, I can do that pretty easily by changing my function arithmetic slightly. What I have to do here is change the uh, change of the, any of the arguments as functions and then have a little test inside here that walks down the various things that came in, finding out which ones are functions and which ones are not, okay, and then doing the right thing. Okay, just giving you examples of, of the, sort of, the sort of thing you can play. And once you do that, of course, if I install that arithmetic, then I can say things like uh, b uh, b times four, 4 plus cosine so, uh, plus sine times uh, applied to three, uh, 3 a where a is a symbolic value okay and what do I get I get the right thing okay so you know the, and this is I have a very large system built on this stuff that I use for teaching advanced advanced classical mechanics in the full terms of my uh, uh, every year I teach with my friend Jack wisdom we teach stuff starting with Lagrange's equations that goes through canonical perturbation theory and even, even things like differential geometry and it's all built on this kind of stuff. So it's very simple and students get to use it. Now, now you, you can see that I can, I, can, I can sometimes want something like a literal function. What if I wanted something which is, so I want to interpret that C as a function? Well, I can't because it's, you know, I can't distinguish it from a number. Okay, well that's a problem, we'll worry about that later, but of course what I could really do is make up a thing that says if any, any literal function is really just a thing which, when, uh, which puts his name on something. Okay? That works, uh, it's, not, it's not very safe to do it that way, I have to do better work, and if I want to be able to take derivatives of things like that, I better know what I'm doing, and so on, but I'm not talking about that today. Okay? However, at least I've got this, I've got this thing working pretty well now. Okay? So I can say, I can add, I can add a, num a, a, a symbolic number or a symbolic function, okay, to cosine and sine, okay, and I can get the appropriate algebraic expression, okay. And so here's really, you know, I, get, I, can, add, I can have an algebraic simplifier, which is itself a complicated problem, probably far more complicated than almost anything else I've even, I'm not going to tell you how to write one of those, because sometimes an algebraic simplifier is a complicator. And uh, it's exactly what you mean by simple depends upon what you're going to use the result for. So there's a lot of a lot of difficulty there. But imagine I had something called the simplifier, which I do, okay, then which tries to do something reasonable. Then if I take two steps of the evolution of a completely symbolic uh, system with in fact a literal a literal acceleration function, then I get this fairly horrible object. Okay? But you know, if I were debugging an, a, a, a numerical program, it's very important for me to do this, to be able to symbolically evaluate it and examine it. And indeed, you know, a lot of good compiler technology is in fact the same thing as simplifying a, a, symbolic, uh, a symbolic evaluation of a, of a program. Okay, and so, you know, I think that we should really not consider a compiler to be anything other than uh, a fairly complicated simplifier of such a thing with maybe a translation phase to some other, some other language and maybe a simplification of that language too. Okay, okay so now I'm going to get back to, to uh, this, this, this biological metaphor because I'm going to, see what I've shown you so far looks pretty daring but it isn't. It was very simple. And it was simple in a way that was constraining me a lot. I had to know what all the algebraic operators are going to be ahead of time. I had to have a library. I had to have that library packaged into a into a package. Hmm? Now that was that was already that's already too much from my point of view. I want to loosen this up. Okay, and the, yeah, I'm, I'm inspired by this character. This is a uh, particular frog, quite different from the one you saw before, but it looks the same, right? Frogs all look the same. Um, 
Uh, this guy is, is Gastrothica rhea bombay. Uh, he's been known since about 19, 1913 or something, like a bird. It's a big yolk, and then there's a little flat disc that turns into the frog. Now that by itself is not a big deal. The big deal is that different embryonic tissues combine to make the see the organs in this frog than in, than in the standard frog. So there's more than one way to make a frog. <laughs> That's the yes sir. It's an argument for intelligent design. It's undergone a refactoring. <laughs> <laughs> you can't do it, I'd fight with you over that one. But uh, I, I think it's... Points about that <laughs> right. <laughs> I think it's what it is. It's, it's a. Well, I think it is. Is that there's there's the ability to tweak things under the ta under the table, right? That evolution has had the has has the nice feature that makes it really more powerful than what we do. Is you don't have to figure it out ahead of time. Okay. You build this thing called a frog, and then you can tweak it by changing the order in which things happen in the development. For example, okay. That's pretty uh, pretty wild. So you make a completely different kind of frog. Okay, well, you make the same frog, but a different way. Okay, now, now, so I want to be, I want to be more like that. I want to have, I want to have that kind of freedom. Okay, and I want to show you some of that. So I'm going to go to show you, what, this is what I'd like things. Again, I'm going back to my, this is back to my uh, mantra for today. Okay, I want you to, I, here's my ball of mud. Okay, first of all, let's say why I'm worried about this. Not everything is arithmetic. Arithmetic, arithmetic is very, very simple. Okay? But I can start dealing with things like sequences, which is much more complicated because I can infinite sequences. I, I see some closure over there. Okay? And they, infinite sequences are a strong a component of the closure world. Okay? Um, and they, well, they should be. Uh, they should be the same as lists. Okay? Really. That's, that's a mistake I made long ago in, in, in the scheme before I understood that, okay, that they weren't the same. Okay, that the, the streams in the list should be the same. That, and they should have the same operators that apply to them. Okay? I, should, they, I have vectors, and they have you know, different, different kinds of properties, of course. Vectors are auto one axis. Okay? Uh, there are character strings, there are, there are other things like that. There are various procedures appropriate for those. Okay? And the diversity there is much more complicated than what you find in algebra. Okay? But it's worse than that. Okay? You have things like sets. Okay? And, and that can, get, get, can drive you nuts too. And you have things as, dist as distinct as linear lists and hash tables. Okay? They have to be sort of merged together to make one idea of how to deal with sets. Where you have unions, intersections, and everything else like that. Okay? So, the, so when you want to start, you start dealing with really complicated systems, more like we deal with in, in computation, you don't really want to be constrained by the feeling that you know all of the operators you're going to deal with ahead of time. There isn't a package. Of, the package I'm interested in is the package of everything. Okay? I want everything to be generic and modifiable. Okay, so as a consequence, here's my ball of mud. You see? I want to be able to say things like this. I'm going to make a, make a generic operation. I'm going to give it a name for purposes of debugging called foo. Okay? I happen to also name it foo for, for my, my access here. Okay? And I'm going to say, uh, I'll add to it, well, if uh, all the, uh, if all the, uh, the arguments, it's a generic operation of, of arity two, and if all, the, all two arguments are numbers, then I'm going to add them. Okay? Uh, I could have written, if I, were being, if I were being more obscure, I would have just written a plus here, because in scheme I can do that. Okay? I wouldn't have to write lambda AB plus AB because there's nothing special about plus. Okay? And then if I, however, if I want it to be, if any of, them, any of them is symbolic and the others are numbers, I want to be able to uh, consign the, the, the plus onto the arguments. Okay? Just like I did before. And so I get this sort of behavior. Okay? So that's a, that's a, 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 much more, a much more flexible way, because I'm not assuming I know ahead of time what all the, the parts are. Okay? Now, here's how I'll have to tell you how I make this. I'm going to have the operation be a thing which Doug calls the generic dispatch, based on some metadata that's going to be stored somewhere and, um, of, on, on, the opera, on the operation. This is going to be, that's a put. Okay, it says I'm attaching it by some by some by hash table or something like that. Okay, the metadata, and then 
When I add to a generic operation, I'm just adding stuff to the metadata, a rule, an applicability rule, coupled with a, a way to, to, to apply, a handler. Okay? And generic dispatch is going to go chasing down in the metadata looking for an applicable rule. And if I find such a rule, apply it, otherwise I, I have an error. Okay? So that's sort of, it's now, of course, there's some details to make this actually efficient. It has to be reasonably efficient. Okay, and that takes, that takes clever Chris Hansen type work. Okay, <laughs> uh, basically how do you make the compiler turn this into 10 instructions? Okay, <laughs> but, but that's a separate issue. Okay, now I go back to arithmetic. I'm gonna invent, I'm gonna make new packages again. But I'm gonna make packages, but now I'm gonna be much more flexible. I'm gonna make a package called the, the generic package. Okay, and it's, it's gonna be a thing called generic over the base arithmetic. Takes a, it's a, any object will be its input possible, and what it does, it does the it, it pulls out the generic operation, okay. It makes a, it makes a generic operation appropriate for it, okay. And to add to a generic operation, all, I'm, uh, all arithmetic, all I'm going to do is is uh, add an arithmetic to it like this, okay. For every name in there that's in the uh, the the uh, arithmetic operators of the extra arithmetic I've got, which might be a package of things. I'm going to then go walking through this and and uh, pull out the generic operation, the basic, the other operation, and crunch them together. Okay. So it's sort of a this is a, this is this is very flexible, and yet there are still lots of constraints here. This is not a not a completely uh, un, un, uh, unconstrained system. So I'll give you some examples of what I might do. Okay. Yes, is there somebody there? Did you want to come in? Well, come in. Here. Oh, I see. Yes. Okay. Yes, I see somebody lurking. <clears throat> well, you've missed almost all of it, but that's beside the point. Okay. <laughs> okay. So, for example, here's how, here's how I might make myself a package like this. I might take, start with the, I'm uh, making generic arithmetic out of a numeric arithmetic package, so I'm pulling up a bunch of operations this time. Okay. But now I'm going to add numeric arithmetic to it. That does not the same thing as I'm, I'm just picking out, here I'm just picking out the operation names. Here I'm saying for every operation name, I'm going to add the numerical stuff. Here I'm going to add the function arithmetic over the numerical stuff. Here I'm going to add the, the symbolic arithmetic over the numerical stuff. And I'm going to install that. And now I get lots of things except one bug. We'll worry about that in a second. OK? You see, that's not, turns out I've, I've done something nasty. What I've done nasty is I've introduced some order, order dependencies that are worse than the ones I had before. It depends on the order in which I build things. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay, Aww. okay. <laughs> yeah, well that, that's true. I have to worry about that. And that's a, that's a, a cost of being flexible in this way. Okay. Now, an alternate way to think, which I did not implement, and which would be fun to do, and I probably will next time I think of it, I think, you know, next time I have an all-nighter to, to pull off, okay, which I love to spend all night reprogramming. But what I, what next time what I'm going to do is I'm going to make it so that I'll have the machine try all possible orders, okay, and see if there's any that converge, that's the right one, unless there's two of them that converge, then they better be equal, okay? But that's a, because that's the way the real, real things ought to work. It's the same way biological systems work, sort of. Okay, you know, if there's degeneracy in biological systems. Degeneracy meaning, like in physics, we talk about a degenerate eigenvalues in a in in, in quantum mechanics. It means that there, there are many ways to get that the eigenvalue because there's multiple eigenvectors. So, um, so, you know, degeneracy. What I mean here is that, well, as from biological point of view, uh, if I fail to be able to eat sugar anymore for some reason, you know, I lost the ability to process. Uh, glucose. Okay, I can still get energy by 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 uh, eating proteins. Okay? Eating proteins. Yeah, it turns out that there are different pathways, and that for the most part, you can you could you may not be able to survive very long that way. But certainly, there are many things like that. Certainly, if I hurt my right arm, I can do a lot of things with my left arm, including write badly. Okay, so it's a there's a the, the degeneracy means there's many ways to do it. It's not the same as redundancy. Redundancy is, the, a kidney is redundant, it's got a gazillion copies of the same machine. But if you have many, many, many different machines, each of which does approximately the same thing, that's called degeneracy. 
Okay, and that's that's a very powerful thing uh, to build into programs. We don't do that very often. It sounds great, uh, graceful degradation. Yes, but graceful degradation by having more than way to solve the same problem. Such that if any if any of the ways fails, there may be other <coughs> ways to do it. Okay. Yes, sir. Could you repeat? I couldn't hear what the strategy was. If, uh, you're trying all the possibilities. I was saying yes. I can imagine that writing a little, a little sort of operating system basically that pulls out the uh, the various the, the various uh, applicable operators opera operations for an operator, and then it turns out in any particular way I did it, some order, w one way it doesn't work, I might try the other orders until I find one that does. And if I find all of them that, w that could work, they better have the same answer. Otherwise, it, that really is an error. Okay? That may be something that has to be tracked down by something else. Okay? But that's, so that's another way to get around that. And I, but, but right now, I'm putting up with the fact that I have an, an order dependency problem. Okay? Because I'm showing you the sort of real guts of this thing. You see real order dependencies. Okay? So for example, I can change your I can closure. This is a different closure. <laughs> uh, this is this is if I change the order, for example, I can do it this way, I can make everything generic. I can always add to the generic arithmetic and make everything built over the generic arithmetic, and that works very well. See what I did before here was I built everything over numeric arithmetic and just added it to the generic arithmetic. But I can in fact use the generic arithmetic as my base arithmetic and then build things over that. Okay, and that, that does a that gives me a, a considerably better organization such that all these things work. In fact, I can even do things like this. Okay. So all of a sudden things start working that you wouldn't expect. Okay? And that's the best situation. Best situation is when things that work that you didn't expect them to. Okay. Okay. But we still have an order dependency, which I have to solve. Okay, a little bit more. So I can do that with some by making unambiguous rules, it turns out, by in fact changing it slightly so that the symbolic arithmetic is over the numeric arithmetic by itself. I don't want to go into the details of why this is true, but now I have something that really works for every case that I've shown you before. And it's it's much cleaner and easier to work with. Okay, because I can actually add to things without having uh, get, known about them ahead of time. Okay. So now, going back to where I, I, I where we started, okay, uh, here's my, I'm going to look at the, the uh, literal force law, here f, some literal function f, okay? I'm going to start with a symbolic initial history, I'm going to look at one, one step of the evolution, okay? What happens? Well, I'm going to, if I, what if I look at two steps? It's getting, it's getting pretty bad, but I'm already beginning to see things that I wouldn't, I wanted to fix. As a good programmer, I don't like this. Because I'm evaluating, I'm evaluating this guy several times. Right? And that's the most expensive process in, in doing an integration. So of course what I want to do here is, is, is um, common sub-expression elimination. Bam. Now I've got that. Okay? That looks pretty good. Okay? And by golly, yes. So I'm sort of about to, con uh, to converge and, and summarize, okay? What I've been showing you is some very dangerous games I play, okay? I promise, I, I, I believe that they, that, that take careful, careful but dangerous programming is actually a very good strategy. And the reason why it's good is because it allows you to try things very fast and get them to work. Okay? It is the case that there are many things that you do. Look, many of the mutations in biological systems are, are, are fatal. We know that. But basically what you end up with is a very robust mechanism when it works. There are lots of cases where, where this could, 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 could be improved. Okay? And I'm not trying to say this is the right way to do everything. I, as I said before at the very beginning, if I have a garbage collector, yes, that's the case where I'm going to prove it's correct. I have to put in the effort to make sure that the garbage collector is not going to screw things up because that's very hard to debug. Okay? That's the reason. It's not because I care that it's right. I care that it's very hard to debug. Okay? It's hard to debug a program if the garbage collector fails. Okay? That's not the same. And what I want to make sure is things be debuggable, easily modifiable and debuggable very fast. With, uh, with very little effort. Okay? So I'm going to talk a little about, first of all, philosophy again. Okay? There are all these 
things people think of as being the right way to do things. Okay? I have lots of friends who will tell me that the right thing to do is you whip the programmer until, uh, until he, he does it right. This is the Dijkstra theory. <laughs> right? <laughs> okay. Okay. Then there's people who say, well, you know, object-oriented programming clearly is the right way to do everything. Or functional programming is clearly the right way to do everything. Hmm, maybe. I like it. I enjoy programming that way. Okay? But, it does, but that's the thing. There's rule-based systems. There's logic-based programming. There's constraint-based programming. There are neural networks, genetic programs, Bayesian networks. And all about. I've tried all of these things. Okay? They're all good. They're good for something. Each one's good for the kinds of things it's good for. Okay? And in fact, the most important thing is a really good engineer has a pretty big toolkit. And what really matters is you use the right tool at the right time for the right purpose. Okay? And these tools have to be better be able to work together. Go to the machine shop, which I do a lot. I like the machining stuff. Okay? It better be the case that the collet that, goes in, that I pull off the shelf better go into the mill in the right place and, and, and fit the appropriate taper. Okay? And if it doesn't, I've got the wrong machine shop. Somebody's done something wrong. Okay? Well, the problem we have in, in most programming is you try to do something in, in language X that is object-oriented language, but all of a sudden you need something that really is functional, it's not going to come out nice. Okay? You know, you want something, you've got something that's going to, you're going to write, that's obviously should be logic programming, basically backtracking and things, and, by, you know, a tree search of some sort, and you've got to write it with, a, with, a, with an object-oriented thing, ugh, it's going to look awful, and it's going to be hard to understand, okay? And yet, if, I, if I'm going to make a device driver, I don't want to write it in, in functional style. That's terrible also. It's not going to work. I don't care what the, 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 the Haskell people here might think I'm wrong, <laughs> well, I, 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 I will uh, charge them with the problem of controlling a telescope, um, you know, mirror support system sometime. Okay. You know, you have to actually worry about the timing of little things that are moving around, and they better move around in such a way as not to break a, bill a half billion dollar mirror. Okay. You know, I've done that sort of stuff. Okay, so there are all these magic bullets. Okay, and I'm, I'm worried about that. And the most important, here's my, here's my real suggestion for everyone. Don't shoot yourself in the foot with any magic bullet. <laughs> okay? <laughs> okay. <laughs> because nothing is the right thing. No, none of these things are right for everything. Okay? What you really want is to have all of them in the, and every other one that I haven't thought of yet. Okay? <laughs> but what you care about is this. That the, the stuff you build is additive, and that's what I put, spent a lot of time on today. Late binding means I don't make a decision until I have to. Okay? The parts are interchangeable, and, they're easily, uh, and they easily operate with each other. That's what really matters. Okay? And all these other things are just, are just particular theories of how to do that, which work sometimes. Okay? So, here's, I've, I've got lots of ideas about this. As I teach a class about this, of which you've just heard maybe about a week of that class. It's a 13-week class. Okay? But the, um, I, I teach a, week, a class about this where I, I worry about robustness. About, and the ideas come from biology, from math, from engineering. Degeneracy is a case that I worry about. Okay? And there's exploratory behavior which has to do with backtracking and, and street search and various things like that using combinators. And then this other thing which I think is very important which is to not worry so much about proofs. Okay? You have to use proofs sometimes but don't think that's the, the, going to solve your, the problem of making your programs really good. Okay? What it's going to do is, is, in fact, it's got a bad feature. Supposing you were, again, the Mr. Dijkstra type person who says you have to prove the program before you even type it in. Okay? Okay. So what that, mean, that means is that, well, in order to do that, I have to work really, really hard to make each part very perfect. But, you know, it's very hard to, uh, to prove general theorems. So I make each part as specific as possible. Its inputs are very limited to exactly what they're going to be. Okay? Under those circumstances, I made a very br brittle structure. I push on it and it falls over. Okay? It works just great for the problems it was made, designed to work for. I care about making things that work for the problems they're not designed to work for. Okay? That's the, that's the difference. And I suppose that's pretty much it for me, and that's what I want to talk about today. And I'm happy to pick arguments with anybody. <laughs> <laughs> I learned something, because I, I, one of the greatest things I ever found is that uh, my students teach me more than I know. Okay? So.
question. Yes, sir. Why did MIT switch from C to Python? <laughs> oh, well, first of all, it's a much more complicated story than that. Uh, we had a we had a uh, curriculum that was started around 1980, which I was one of the authors of. Uh, the curriculum uh, was a four four class, 15 hours per class, hours per week, okay, class. Uh, each of which was about had an idea in it about a language for engineering, where language meant something much more general than something like the word scheme or C or anything. Okay, so the languages were basically the kind of programming, programming. Another one was sort of electrical circuits. Another one was um, was signals and systems type stuff. And another one was a computer architecture-like stuff, okay? Which are languages in the sense that one of them is about is about how to do things, okay? Another is about is, ab is about how the stru how combinations of pieces make bigger pieces that are also pieces. That's what electrical circuits are really the best language in that sense, okay? And then then the the, uh, the signals and systems thing was about about composition of functions and feedback, okay? And then and then the computer architecture thing is a bigger picture of all, okay? About things like balancing loads and stuff like that, okay? That was a very nice, and it ran, that ran from 1980 to about, about 2000, okay? However, uh, and, and 6001 was, w which I, I, I invented, and then I got Hal on, and so that, where that uh, went for, from, from 1980 to 1997. Uh, we, we both became rather uh, tired of it, having done it for that long, although we did other things also. Uh, so we, we sort of quit, to be perfectly honest, in 1997. The, um, the, reason, the reason why we thought it was sort of out, out of date at the time, and we did, is that engineering had changed drastically over the, over the period of, say, the 1990s in a way that was sort of discontinuous. And I'll explain what that was like. In, at the beginning of the, of the 1990s, there were still resistors, transistors, capacitors, inductors, right? And you could put them together and make bigger things out of smaller things. And you knew what every one of the things did. That is, there was a very clear description. If you got a chip, you got it out of the TTL data book, yep. it had at most 20 pins, and there was a one-page description that was perfect, okay? By the end of the, 19, uh, of the 1990s, all of a sudden there were 1,000 pin chips with manuals this fat, and the person who wrote the manual didn't know what was inside the chip. Okay? And the person who designed the chip didn't know what the manual was going to be. So they were inconsistent, and furthermore, there was a lot of top secret stuff in it that you couldn't find out anyway. Okay? So, so that's, and that's true also of, of programming. At the beginning of the, uh, of the 1990s, continuing from the past, Things were made out of little parts like addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, cons, car cutter, stuff like that. At the end, there were these enormous libraries of things like graphics libraries and this, that, and the other with thousands of functions written into a, a, a giant manuals. Okay? And so what I discovered for around the middle of the 1990s was my students were spending most of their time reading man pages. It was a very different thing from, from the kind of programming that we were teaching. Okay. So we, what we, what, what I suppose the answer was that it seemed to me that the change in the engineering type that we were do, that was needed in the future was no longer so much pressure on understanding how a bigger thing is made out of smaller things by combining the parts and, and understanding that how, from the piece the way the parts work and the ways they're put together how you get something bigger to work. That sort of analysis and synthesis view, okay, to one which is more like science. You grab this piece of library and you poke at it. You write programs that poke at it, see what it does, and you say, can I tweak it to do the thing I want? Which is what we do now a lot. Mm -hmm. okay? And that was true of the chips as well. So it seemed to me that sort of we, had, we had the kind of engineering we were doing, in the, it, was, it was, although still important intellectually, it was no longer relevant to the kind of things people needed. Okay? 
So that, so I suppose uh, Hal and I basically walked into the department head's office on you know, sometime in, in the end of 1997 and said, we quit on this, okay? Figure out what to do. Uh, for 10 years after that, they couldn't figure out what to do. The department head uh, himself taught the class. This was, uh, this was uh, uh, Grimson, Eric Grimson, very smart guy. But he didn't, his heart wasn't in it because that wasn't his thing. You know, and the most important thing you have to do when you get two people teaching a class is you get the people who teach the class to be the people who want to teach that class. Okay, that's, and who, who, that's their thing. Uh, so uh, committees were formed and committees do their things and so on. And it was determined that the right thing was to worry about essentially I.O. driven type stuff, which is probably true where you have things where there's sensors and there's action and there's something like little robots and there's, there's, um, uh, the, the, there's uncertainty due to the fact that the motors aren't exactly right, they're not perfect, and so on, and they're not well specified. And that's right, so, so there was a, there was a uh, hunting around for some people who might want to put something like that together. People did, uh, and that, that was mildly successful. Um, the difficulty with it is that it didn't produce a very coherent structure. Like the 6001 was a very coherent structure. In fact, the four, the four course, course the introduction to electrical engineering and computer science that we had previously was more coherent. And, and we're still hunting for the right thing now. Okay? We don't know what the right thing is. And it's not like we have a, the you know, engineering chain made a big change and we have to find out a way to do it. Okay. The reason why Python was chosen at the time was it was for exactly the reason Python made it in general. It was enormous libraries for everything. And therefore, therefore you didn't have to, it was a late binding decision. Okay. Okay. That they basically, which is the right thing. That because of the fact that for reasons no one understands, all of a sudden Python acquired this enormous library structure which allowed, allowed people to say, I'll make a thing that does this, that, or the other thing, and they found all the stuff they wanted. Okay, in particular things that can move a robot around. How's that? <laughs> <laughs> yes? So, you spoke a lot about yeah. the uh, danger to our dangerous techniques, dangerous ideas, and the pursuit of them. What is the connection between robustness and danger? How can you push that biological metaphor <laughs> further? Well, I think I, I think I actually am working on that very hard. Um, the the b essential idea there. You want you want. To, did you want to answer the question? Oh, he he's asking what is the connection between the robustness and danger, okay? That may uh, that that is illustrated by the biological metaphor, okay? And of course, the answer there, as far as I can see, is nothing is perfect, okay? However. To make something that always does as reasonable a thing as it can under the circumstances, which is exactly, you know, I did put on the on the abstract for this talk, Postel's law, right? Which is that you should always be be generous in what you accept, and very particular about what you put out, okay? Because that means that that you could build a system which has lots of flexibility in the sense that, that every part is trying its best not to be the thing that kills the system. It's trying its best to be, to do what's reasonable at the time. The difficulty with that is it encourages people to, be, to stick on, you know, to, to, uh, to play on the corners, right? It encourages out of band behavior by, the, by, by people who don't have to. Now we got away with this in digital electronics by inventing the, what we call the, what's called the, uh, uh, it's the sort of, it's the, it's the, set, the set fact where the voltages are in the right place. There's a name for this. I just lost it. Threshold? No, no, no. The, uh, huh? Hmm? No, sorry. I'm talking about, I'm talking about the, what's called, the static discipline. That's the word. The static discipline. Okay, where the outputs of a, of, a, of a digital device are constrained to be much narrower in what they are allowed to be than the inputs that they must accept. Okay? And that's for every, for all devices in a family. And that leads to extreme noise immunity. Okay? That's a, that's a, a beautiful day example of, of Postel's law. Okay? And it, 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 indeed, the reason why it works in the digital world is because the manufacturers choose not to play games on the corners because what they end up doing that, if they're doing that is they lose their noise immunity, which is what a big selling point. Okay? 
is the problem is computation. It's hard to it's hard to make it a selling point that they, that you by tweaking this thing it'll still work. You know, by trying it on something that didn't you didn't expect, it would still work. That's a very hard thing to sell, but I think it's probably the right thing. Okay, is that a good answer to your question? Well, um, why don't you stand up and talk louder so he can hear you in the back? So I'm wondering much more about how professional programmers, developers. <coughs> Incorporate this notion of danger in their work, and how does robustness, this notion of robustness, generic and flexibility arise from taking those risks? Gee, I don't know. Is the right answer? I could say that most things that are built don't have to be perfect. Right? I don't think it would matter very much if one percent of all the queries that were accepted by Google didn't work. Right? It just doesn't matter. Okay? What matters is that, the, that, that it always produces a reasonable result. And I think the people there, people like that, know that. They do the right thing. Uh, I think that the, the place where we have to worry is a couple of places where there's legal requirements like banking. Conservation of money is a high, is, in a bank is important. The conservation <laughs> law, right? The conservation law is, 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 is imposed by law. I, I only ask this because yes. I run a fintech startup Yes. We build expert systems which try to reduce risks. Of course. But yes, of course. And so that's an example of a case where, where you have to be exactly right. Okay? There are cases where people think they have to be right, like in autopilots, which I disagree with. Okay? And there are places where people are, are pressured to be exactly right in things like medical devices which is probably, probably hard, to, hard to argue because the patient was going to die anyway, but, you know, what the heck, okay? You know, it's very hard to, it's hard to deal with that, too. So, so I think that there's a, there's a, the question of how much risk you should be allowed to take partly is determined by how many lawyers are uh, breathing it out of your neck, okay? Yes. Yes, sir? You want to talk loud so other people can hear you? Uh, that's a plumbing model, actually. Pro he asked about the propagator model, which is a thing uh, that was uh, worked on for by me for many, many years, starting with Richard Stallman in 1975, <laughs> actually, when I hired him to work for me and when he was an undergraduate at Harvard. Uh, it was a, we did electrical circuit stuff, and we made, we made little programs that were uh, where the way the program worked is a little box would look at the th some of the cells around it and say what values are in them and make deductions okay, based on them and carry the dependencies around. That was a good thing. And the most recent advances in this were done by, by Alexei Radul in his doctoral thesis in 2009. But we also had, you know, Guy Steele's PhD thesis was about that too, about constraint propagation and so on. So I've been worried about this for a long time. Uh, that's a, it turns out, that is not connected to what I'm saying about today, except for the fact that all good programs, I think, should be very generic in the way they're built. Generic operators are crucial, and the, and the user programmable generic operators are crucial. Now, what, what the propagator thing is, is an alternate way of plumbing systems. If we look at things like Lisp, or almost all languages we know, okay, they are expression languages meaning that the output of anything is one thing. Yeah, we can fool around and have va multiple value returns, but basically it's an it's a, it's a expression machine. Okay? It's a funnel where stuff comes up from a, well, lots of inputs and produces outputs. Okay? Uh, the propagator idea is one where you, you are n not dealing with fundamentally trees, but you're thinking about networks of machines that talk to each other. Okay? And that gives you a little bit more flexibility and again, one of, my, one of my goals is to figure out ways to make various tools that can flexibly interop, operate with each other. I can imagine that each tool that you use makes a little propagator box for the program it's running, but the way they talk to each other in a way that prevents, allows them to cooperate involves a different kind of plumbing, okay? More of an electrical engineer's view of the world. I want 50 ohm cable with BNC connectors, okay? Got it. Yes, sir. Has anyone uh, started to do a formal or informal work on developing a metric 
for when we can, um, when we when we have to be exact versus when when the system can have some kind of, some sort of tolerance or be robust. In these kind of I don't know. I certainly haven't. Okay. However, there's a good piece of work for you to do. <laughs> okay. I think it would be nice to figure that out. I have no idea. Yes, sir. On the previous question, would you please expand a little bit more about the propagator? Oh. And, and, and even give an example. Yes. Okay. Well, I would, what I don't have here is a um, is a chalkboard, but that's okay. You actually have one. Oh, he wants to know more about propagators. Okay, that's. Oh, there is. Oh, well. Okay. Okay, I, I, love, I love writing on, I don't like whiteboards, but chalkboards are really better, uh, and they're much better. Uh, and the reason is because chalkboards uh, don't smell. Uh, no, they're dusty, but they don't smell. Remember, what they, chalk is basically Tums. Yeah, it's pretty harmless. Uh, okay, so the propagator idea which is that there are, the world is made out of little autonomous machines. You can think of these as these little machines, okay? By and. By machine you mean a computer? Huh? By machine you mean a computer? Well, maybe. Okay. maybe it may be an electrical circuit. I don't really care, okay? okay? A computer just is an electrical circuit that happens to have, have be universal in its ability to be programmed. <laughs> yes, it could be something like, it could be something like, like an x86 for all I care with, with, with a gigabyte of RAM, okay? That's, yeah, I mean, and, then, and then these things, you know, they talk through things called cells. Yeah, so that, say, this guy, uh, uh, you know, this guy talks to this guy. Yeah, there's these cells that they talk through. You know, and the goal is, so these are, these little machines are green and the cells are, the cells are black. Okay, the cells are not, are not repositories of a single value. They are repositories of information about something. Okay? For example, they could be information about the height of this beer bottle. Okay? Now we have, may, may have many ways of measuring the height of the beer bottle. We may, for example, um, for example, look at the, uh, at the light coming down from, it, uh, from that lamp and look at the shadow, measure the length of the shadow and have a, a and, uh, uh, you know, compare it with a known, a known the measurement that's in the same place and see what the shadow is there and use similar triangles. We might measure the height of this thing by by putting a ruler next to it and seeing. We might measure it by uh, by by I don't know. I, have, I can't think of lots of things for measuring the height of a bear bottle. <laughs> Good. We can Google it. Right. Right. Oh yes, that's right. We can do this. I can't do it, but yes. Okay, you can find measure the frequencies. There's a whole bunch of things that you can do with a beer bottle. Now the the thing is that that these might be in some sense degenerate ways of solving a problem. This might be a thing that knows that's interested in, in the height of the beer bottle. This might be one way of computing it from certain information. This may be another way of computing it from this information. So from this information, okay. This might be a contributor that's getting from somewhere else. Okay? And so what's happened, what each of these little machines is doing is examining the things it knows about, the cells that, are, uh, that, are, that it, it participates in, okay? determines whether any of them has enough information to give me, to tell, allow it to make a deduction where it can change, change a value in, in one of the cell, other cells. Adding new information, not the same as changing it. It adds new information, it contributes that information, and the cells have a means of merging the information. So for example, if the, if the, if the kind of information about the height of the beer bottle was something like a, um, a, a range, okay, say a, 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 an interval, a numerical interval of, of, uh, of centimeters, okay, then, the, uh, then, then the merge would be something that intersects them, okay, producing a better answer. Okay? It also carries uh, a way in which these propagators mostly work is they also carry, they can carry the um, provenance of the information they, that they're combining. So you can say, the reason I believe that this is this high is because these two measurements give me information that overlapped in this way. Okay? 
and you can actually get the thing to type out that kind of information for you. So that's the sort of th I consider that a kind of plumbing for mechanisms. The mechanisms themselves can be arbitrarily, arbitrarily complex, complex or simple machines. See, I'm not worried about what's in there. This one can be written in, in Futran for all I care, and this can be written in, 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 in Haskell, and it all should work. Okay? Does yes. The, the truth maintenance from the yes, truth maintenance is one of the, the one of the what? Yes, what you what, what, he's asking about truth maintenance, which is again the thing came that came up um, in the starting with, again with with Stallman and me, yeah, John but Doyle. and John Doyle was my student and he wrote a, a a master's thesis about this. Gosh, 1976 or something, and then David McAllister wrote a another master's thesis about this later, and then um, and then. Uh, Forbes and Declare wrote a book about this stuff called, uh, and they were my students also. Uh, they, what was that? That was a called, called Human, what was called Building Problem Solvers. Okay, that book. Uh, anyway, so the, but the whole idea there is that, is that when, the, when you combine the information, you also have to be able to combine the provenances in the right way. And that means you have to carry the dependencies correctly. And truth maintenance is a way of maintain, is, is making sure that you've got this right. <laughs> okay, there's all books about it uh, these days. And a lot of SAT solvers have figured this out too. But the, we did it first, I suppose. <laughs> we didn't realize we were building SAT solvers at the time. Yes. So Dole's paper proves that it's an NP-complete problem. Of course. Gotten better than that, or? Oh well, no. But everything's an NP-complete problem. I don't care about <laughs> that. Okay. The, re the real question is whether or not it's, it's tractable right. for real problems. Right. And so, let's see if we. That's a, the, a beautiful example of that. Right. People do use uh, SAT solvers now. Yeah, yeah, three yeah. solvers. Uh, three SAT's terrible, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yet they use them to great effect. Yeah. On, on toy right? problems. Though. Right. The real. The real answer is that. The, re the real answer is that. That. That it's a that. If I'm going to sort with a bubble sort, it's a terrible way to do it unless I'm only sorting 12 elements. Okay? And that's it's the right way. <laughs> okay? Anybody else want to talk or should we adjourn? Yes, sir. So the Pick up, of stand up and they'll tell people to hear you. Oh, I can reject, okay. <laughs> so the nature of computation has evolved a great deal since the 80s. Uh, historically, for example, in the, in the 80s, uh, let's say the state of the art in parallel computing was something like the connection machine. Interestingly developed by people like Hillis, yeah. who later commented that Feynman once commented, you know, computer science is going to be a lot better than physics. It has locality of reference, it has a certain built-in durability, it has a sort of adaptive and graceful degradation the way physical principles do. Now, today, the scale of computation is very different. It's routine for a student to have access to 100 and corporations have access to hundreds of thousands of nodes of computation. Absolutely. That have a far more statistical coalescing quality. There's less determinism, um, there's less guarantees about resiliency and actual system performance, as well as aggregate performance. How do these paradigms, in your opinion, map onto these modern scale problems, which are inordinately larger than we saw? Actually, the reason why, I think the, I think the propagator thing actually does scale directly, because there's no reason why any of these machines have to be in the same place. There's no reason why these little lines that you say there can't be network connections. Okay, this thing scales from the scales from the level of, of chip scale to uh, to arbitrarily large. Okay, uh, but I don't think that again. I'm being very careful. I don't think I have an answer to all the world's problems. Okay, Master. and I want to be very careful to say that that don't let any magic bullet don't shoot yourself in the foot with a magic bullet. Okay, I have some magic bullets I'm playing with now, specifically propagators, but I think that they're dangerous. They're, they're easily, one can easily get addicted to them as easily as one can get addicted to Bayesian networks. Okay? Yes. So that's a, the, the right thing to do is be very careful and see what problem you actually, you ask, you, the right tool for the right problem. Yes, sir, in the back. Are you coming to the bar after the, the talk? Uh, I haven't thought about it. Okay? <laughs> uh, is there a, is there, I, I generally don't drink particularly. But I don't, I don't die. Huh? Huh? Yeah, there's yeah. definitely food. Yeah, you don't have to drink it. Well, I'm, I am slightly hungry, yeah. so sure. Yeah. Okay, awesome. Okay. Okay. Does anybody else have anything? Oh, I, see, I propose we, uh, we adjourn. Any second? Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.
So I'd like to thank Jerry Chuck for speaking with me. It's a pleasure to have him. Um, folks, please, uh, there's a lot of us here, so please make sure you pick up your trash from the way out. So please, let's clean up the equipment. Mm -hmm. I don't need to be my uh, and uh, for those of you who want to join us at the bar, we're going to be heading over to the tennis club. That's Let me turn this. Shut this down. Good. Avenue. Yes. Uh, my name is Brendan Riley. I work with Dave Farber and I also work with John Foster. Oh, good. <laughs> yes. He was a great man. Did you work with Charles Rich? Uh, Charles Rich was my student. So he put, <laughs> he 